Happy Sabbath, everyone. How many of you excited to be here tonight? Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, our time is running out. We are in a race against the clock. Help us to finish strong tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever felt the pressure of time? I have 38 minutes and 43 seconds to tell you what I need to tell you. <laughs> Let me read the, in the book Last Day Events, page 212, we are told, thousands in the 11th hour will see and acknowledge the truth. These conversions to truth will be made with a rapidity that will surprise the church and God's name alone will be glorified. <clears throat> How many of you are looking forward to that time? when thousands will be converted in a day. Isn't that amazing? What are they going to be converted to? They're going to be converted to Jesus Christ, amen? But the reason they're going to be converted is because they're going to hear the preaching of the three angels' messages, amen? amen. And beloved, when we think of the three angels' messages, what do we think of? We think of the mark of the beast. We think of the seal of God. We think of the 2300-day prophecy. We think of the 70-week prophecy. We think of the 1260 years. We think of the fall of Lucifer from heaven. We think of many things. Now, I don't know if you were excited when I said that thousands will be converted in a day. Let me hear it again. Amen. But do you know what that means, beloved? If thousands will be converted in a day because of the preaching of the entire three angels' messages in a day, that means, beloved, that you and I better learn how to preach the three angels' messages in one day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let me ask you something. How many of you have a favorite movie? I know that you're Adventist, you don't go to movies anymore, but you used to have a favorite movie. Yes? If I were to ask you to share with us your favorite movie in about 15 minutes or less, knowing that that movie covered a certain period of time, maybe 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, how many of you think you could share that movie in about 15 minutes or so? Amen? Now, how many of you think you could share the great controversy, the whole thing, in about 15 minutes or so? <laughs> Beloved, here's what we're going to do tonight. We are going to cover, in 36 minutes and 28 seconds, the great controversy. The 2300-day prophecy, the 70-week prophecy, the 1260-year prophecy, the fall of Lucifer from heaven, the millennium, hellfire, and earth made new. Don't pass out. It's going to get done by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Beloved, if I can put it this way, how many of you have ever juiced? Anyone ever juiced before? You take about 20 carrots, you juice it down into one cup, right? We're going to juice the Bible tonight. <laughs> Is that okay? Time is running out. <laughs> There's a race against the clock. Beloved, please listen carefully. I, 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 I've been subtitled this sermon, Earth's Final Movie. The Blueprint, Earth's Final Movie. So I'm going to need your minds to be the screen. Are you ready for the movie? Let's begin. Now, by the way, please excuse me because I usually take about an hour and 20 minutes to do this presentation. I am going to have to speak super fast. Do you forgive me? Are you with me? Are you ready? If you want the full version, come see me later. I'm giving you the super juice version tonight. The book of Ezekiel chapter 28 begins with an angel or, or uh, allows our, or brings our story, begins our story rather, with an angel by the name of Lucifer. Lucifer is described as a covering cherub. A what, everyone? Covering cherub. Now, to understand what a covering cherub is, we must go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, where in Exodus 25, the Bible describes uh, uh, a building that God had instructed Moses to make. That building is called the sanctuary. And inside that sanctuary was a most holy place, which was a reflection of God's throne room in heaven. Are you with me? In that throne room was something called the Ark of the 
covenant and on top of it was something called the mercy seat. Now that mercy seat represents God's throne. Now the mercy seat rests upon the Ark of the Covenant. Listen to what that tells us, beloved, that in heaven the foundation of God's throne was His law because that's what's found in the Ark of the Covenant. Are you with me so far? Now the Bible says that on either side of this ark were two angels and they were called what? Covering angels. That word cover simply means to defend or protect. Listen to what that tells us about Lucifer, beloved. Lucifer's job description in heaven was to protect and defend the law of God. Whoa. He stood in the very presence of God. He was, to, he was to guard the sanctity of that law because it was the foundation of God's government. But the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer was perfect until what? Iniquity was found in him. Now you help me. Iniquity, according to the word of God, is sin. And sin is transgression of the law. So Lucifer, who was supposed to be guarding the law of God, ends up turning against that law. And thus, beloved, the first first war that ever broke out was over the law of God. Okay, we'll work on that. <laughs> now, now, now the question is, why is it, the Bible tells us that Lucifer deceived one-third of angels, amen? And, 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 and we need to ask the question, why is it, how is it that Lucifer deceived one-third of angels? Did Lucifer say, hey angels, would you like to be evil and join me? No, that wouldn't be deception. The book of Isaiah chapter 14 tells us that Lucifer claimed to, he said that I can be or I will be like who? The Most High. Let's put it together. To be like the Most High means to be just, it means to be righteous as he is. Holy like he is. Listen to what Lucifer was saying. Lucifer was saying, <clears throat> I can be holy like God without some law telling me how to do it. Okay, you did <laughs> Have you heard that argument before? That we don't need a law in order to be like God? Beloved, that's an argument of self-righteousness. And that's what deceived one-third of angels in heaven. Lucifer didn't say, hey, I want to be evil. He said there are other ways to righteousness other than obeying God. That's how the rebellion began. That's how he deceived one-third of angels. So the, how many of you are following me in your movie so far? <clears throat> the Bible tells us that Lucifer and his angels were cast out. The question now becomes, why is it that Lucifer was not immediately judged? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Very simple, beloved. The answer is a profound one. You see, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verses 16 through 19, the Bible lays out a principle there given to Moses and the children of Israel. Whenever a controversy arose between two parties, there had to be a third party or what, everyone? a third party to discern between the two. That's only fair, isn't that right? Now, let's take that very same principle and bring it back to our story in heaven. When Lucifer and his angels rebel, how many sides are there in heaven? Two, God and his angels, the devil and his angels. It's as though there's a stalemate. The devil is accusing God, and for God to sit over judgment of the devil at that point in time would have been seen to be unfair. It's like you trying to take me to court, and I say, okay, and I'm the judge. Okay, so, so in the book of Ezekiel, the Bible says there, uh, uh, when God is speaking of casting out Lucifer, he says, Lucifer, I'm going to lay you before kings that they may behold you. This term appears to be synonymous with, with some kind of judgment. And I can imagine in my, in my pastoral imagination, Lucifer scratching his head going, who are you going to get to judge me, God? Don't you know all heaven is polarized into two sides? Beloved, here's a question. Who would be the jury, the third party that God would use to judge Lucifer? You're looking at him right now. <laughs> you see, beloved, listen, there is something about jury selection that we should know. When a jury is selected, they like to choose people who have little or no first-hand knowledge of the crime. Guess what? Where was humanity when Lucifer rebelled? We weren't even created yet. So far, so good. 
How about this? A juror must be a law abiding. <laughs> a juror must be a law abiding citizen. And, and beloved, we know that Adam and Eve were created with the law of God written on their hearts. And number three, beloved, a juror must be able to discern between right and wrong and must not be swayed by public opinion. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Know you not that we shall judge angels? We are the kings that God created partially to serve as jurors. Let me tell you something. Jury duty, don't skip out. So, beloved, Lucifer sees this creation of man, and he goes, are these the ones that ought to judge me? Hmm, what shall I do? What shall I do? Beloved, if you had access to a jury that had your fate in their hands, what would you do? Seek to bribe the jury. Satan comes to Eve in the garden, and does he say to Eve, hey, Eve, would you like to be evil? No, 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 no. He says, Eve, you can be like... Huh, does that sound familiar? It's the same thing he said to the angels. Are you with me in your movie so far? So, Adam and Eve sin, and they are disqualified from jury selection. Jesus comes to the garden, and he gives them a promise. And, beloved, we can ultimately know that the gospel was given to restore mankind to being sound jurors who know the difference between right and wrong, and who are law-abiding citizens. Are you with me so far? So now we're going to fast forward the, uh, our movie scene a, a little bit, and now we're going to go down to the book of Exodus. And beloved, in the book of Exodus, what we find is that God is about to call a people out of captivity. Who are they? They're the Israelites. Now, beloved, beloved listen to me. In the, it, when, when Lucifer rebelled against God in heaven, he didn't like God's way. God's what, everyone? God's way. Do you know what Psalm 77 verse 13 says? It says, thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. So when Lucifer rebelled against God's sanctuary in heaven, he was really rebelling against God's way. When God calls the children of Israel and he is getting ready to use them as his people who are to bring salvation to the world, he gives them something special. I call it the blueprints. Or God's GPS. The gospel plan of salvation. <laughs> Thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. And beloved, what happens is that when you're looking for the way, it means that you must be lost. So God, he looks down at Israel and he says, Israel, I'm going to give you a special gift. In that gift is the way. I want to use you to take this way, this GPS, to the whole world. So now you can begin to understand how must Satan have felt when he saw the replica of what was in heaven now on earth. Wait a minute. This is the thing that is to guide all people to salvation. We hate it. We're going to destroy it, and we're going to destroy the people who possess it. We cannot allow this truth to go into the world. You say, Pastor, so this blueprint, what do you mean blueprint? Like, like, like how is it the path of salvation? So we're going to take a look. Now, I'm going to put a picture up on the chart, up on the screen. And it'll probably only be there for a little while. I'm going to need you to memorize this picture because I'm not going to be able to put it up very often. All right, are you with me? Do you see the picture? Is the picture up there? No picture. There we go. Now, you help me. When you took a bird's eye view of the sanctuary, when you went into the outer court, you came to two articles of furniture. They were the altar of sacrifice. That's right down there in the bottom. And then there was the... Labor. Now, the altar of sacrifice is where animals are what? Sacrifice. And by the way, what does that represent? The sacrifice of who? Jesus Christ. Very good. Then you have the labor. That's where the priest would wash their hands and their feet. And beloved, that symbolized simply what in the gospel? Baptism. Very good. You go up and you see the table of showbread. And the table of showbread represents what? 
the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then you have the altar of incense, which represents our what? Prayers. Very good. And then the seven branch candlestick represents what? It represents the Holy Spirit, but our witness through the Holy Spirit. Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle. It's your witness. And then you got into the most holy place, and there was the Ark of the Covenant. So there goes our blueprint. Now, do you, got, do you have the picture? You remember this picture? So how is it that this that this sanctuary is, the, is God's gospel plan of salvation. Well, if you'll remember the picture that you just saw, if you were to trace around the outer edges of the articles of furniture, do you know what you find? You should know because you saw it. You see a cross. Somebody say amen. amen. Can you imagine 3,000 years before Jesus comes upon the scene, the sanctuary prophesied that Christ would die on a cross for our sins? He says, I am the what? Way, the truth, and the life. Not only that, beloved, but as you look at that sanctuary, you also find something else very interesting. Because in each place where an article of furniture is, there Christ was wounded. Nail in the left hand, nail in the right hand, a crown of thorns on his head. He died of a broken heart, nails in his feet. Beloved, even to the point where when he was pierced in his side, Okay, all right. Blood and water come out. All right, well, let's try this one. God delivers his people through this plan, through this path, over and over again. Let's take the children of Israel. Israel, uh, 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 when they were, when they, uh, uh, were being led out of captivity, the first thing God did was he told them to make a sacrifice and put the blood on the post. What article of furniture? What article of furniture? The altar of sacrifice. Very good. That's Exodus 12. In Exodus 14, they're on their way to freedom, and then Pharaoh says, what have I done? I changed my mind. Go get them. And what does God do? He opens the Red Sea. Come on, someone. What is that? It's the, it's the labor. It's baptism. Whoo. After they get to the other side, that's Exodus 14. After they get to the other side in Exodus 16, guess what happens? They're like, we're hungry. And guess what God does? He rains down manna. <laughs> 21 minutes. <laughs> He rains down manna. So, so, so then after that, I believe it's Exodus 16 or Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 17 or Exodus 19, where God now says to them, Israel, you are my peculiar treasure, my light to the world, my people that I'm going to use for, to bring salvation to the earth. And beloved, what we're seeing there is that God is bringing them, in essence, to the seven-branch candlestick. In that same chapter, Exodus 19, God says to Moses, Moses, I want you to tell the people to spend, to spend three days preparing themselves to meet with me. Heart preparation. Why? Because in Exodus 20, in Exodus 20, beloved, God comes down and speaks what? The Ten Commandments. Let's just do a few more. Is that okay? Jesus is born in a manger among animals. We might say he was born on the altar of sacrifice. He is baptized at the age of 30. That's the labor. He is then led up into the wilderness where he is tempted. The first temptation. You thought I was making this up? <laughs> Turn this stone into... Bread, second temptation, throw yourself down from this cliff and offer a presumptuous prayer to God. Third temptation, I know you came for your people, your seven-branch candlestick. Bow down and I'll give you your people. Jesus overcomes all three temptations and goes on to preach the law combined with the mercy of God. Or we could reverse it. Jesus left heaven, his throne, lived a life of, pray of, of prayer, lived a life based on the word of God, let his light shine, was baptized, and then crucified. Which way do you want it? Which? <laughs> but beloved, ultimately, listen to me. Oh, 
How about this? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all deal with the sacrifice of Christ. The book of Acts is about baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the labor. The book of Romans through Jude all talk about the importance of Bible study, prayer, and witnessing, and then Revelation brings us into the very throne room of God. Amen. Beloved, we ought to know this blueprint. It's the plan of salvation. It's what the world doesn't understand. So now I know that when I want to get saved, there's a process. I must first accept who? Christ. And if I genuinely accept Christ, I will be <clears throat> baptized. And if I'm genuinely baptized and following Christ, I will study the Word, I will pray, and I will what? Witness. And beloved, ultimately when you're sharing this with your friends about the path of salvation, guess where they ultimately are led to? All right, I'll get excited for you. Woo! What? <laughs> so, beloved, get the idea here. God, the devil is angry at this plan of salvation. So watch this. The entire Old Testament is really about how the devil is trying to destroy the people who possess the blueprint and to destroy the blueprint itself. Are you with me? Amen. So it's as though God gives, imagine it like this, the blueprint is a football. And God gives this football to Israel, and he says, take it down the field. But Israel, they begin running down the field, but they begin to rebel against God, and they get so stubborn that God allows them to fall into Babylonian captivity. Well, what happens? We are introduced to the first of three time prophecies in the book of Daniel. By the way, how many of you are with me in the movie so far? Are you following me? Amen? Okay, so, 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 uh, uh, the first prophecy is the 70-week prophecy. Now, the question is, what is this prophecy all about? Very simple, beloved. This prophecy is simply God saying to Israel, Israel, the one to whom the sanctuary points will come in 70 weeks. If you are not ready to receive him, and if you continue in your rebellion, I will take the blueprint from you, and I will give it to somebody else. Guess what happens? Israel comes. Jesus comes. Israel rejects the Christ. You know what happens when he dies? The veil in the temple is rent in two, signifying the end of the earthly blueprint. Jesus, as after his resurrection, ascends to heaven in a heavenly sanctuary and the blueprint, the ball is taken from literal Israel and given to spiritual Israel. Guess what? We just went through the entire Old Testament and we have 16 minutes to go. The clock is ticking. <laughs> God gives Israel the gift of tongues so that they can take this message of a heavenly sanctuary and a heavenly high priest into all the world. And off Israel goes, down the field, nothing can stop them. Satan says, i got to stop these guys. So what does he do? He raises up first literal Israel to attack spiritual Israel. And then he raises up literal Rome to attack spiritual Israel. But he finds that every time a Christian dies, it's, it's working against him because their seed only what? Multiplies. So then he says, I've got to change my tactic. And beloved, that introduces us to the second of three time prophecies in the book of Daniel, the prophecy of the 1260 years. And beloved, this prophecy simply stated that there would rise a power called a little horn, and this little horn would seek to cast down God's blueprint. Are you with me so far? Are you on the edge of your seats? Is your movie, are you following your movie? So the question then becomes, how is it, how does the devil use this little horn power, this, 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 this counterfeit spiritual power to cast down God's sanctuary? It's very simple. We're going to put our chart back up on the screen again. What happened during the Dark Ages? That's a 1260-year period. What happened? The, the, the church of the Dark Ages cast down the truths that were being taught by the sanctuary. Pastor, what do you mean? Very simple. The, the, the altar of sacrifice, which represented Christ's sacrifice, was cast down and replaced with a teaching called penance. Christ's sacrifice is not enough to pay for your sin. You must pay penance. The, 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 the effectiveness of Christ's sacrifice was cast down and something was taught in its place. 
Well, what about the labor which represents baptism? The, the, the church of the Dark Ages said we're going to substitute infant sprinkling in the place of genuine baptism that calls for confession and repentance. Not only did they do that, but they went up into the holy place and said the, the table of shoe bread, which represents the word of God, Matt, you can't understand the word of God for yourself. Only the priest can explain it to you. And they said, listen, we're going to, we, the, 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 the traditions of, of the church are more important than the word of God. Not only did they do that, beloved, but they reached up into that altar of incense, which represents prayer, and they said, you can't pray to God. You have to go through priests. In fact, they even created their own, their own two-compartment room divided by a curtain. Okay. <laughs> With a man sitting in the place of God, hearing the confessions of other men. They put out the light of the church, thus creating the dark ages, and then they went up into the most holy place and took the law and took that seventh-day Sabbath and cast it down and put in its place a first-day Sabbath. Shall we despair? What is God going to do now? Can you, can you see it in your movie? <laughs> Because, beloved, listen, there was one more prophecy called the 2300-year prophecy. And this prophecy stated that at the end of 2300 years, which would be in what year? 1844. At that time, the sanctuary would be what? Cleansed, and some Bibles say restored. <laughs> so watch this. You know what God begins to do? Over a period of 500 years, he begins to restore every truth that had been cast down during the Dark Ages. There was a man by the name of John Wycliffe who comes upon the scene in the 1300s. And what John Wycliffe does is he translates the Bible into the language of the common people, thus restoring the table of showbread. Amen? Beloved, if I was living in the 1300s, I'd been following John Wycliffe all around. But in the 1400s, a man by the name of Martin Luther is born. And Martin Luther begins the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. And, and what Martin Luther does is he restores the truth that it is a sacrifice of Christ that pays for our sins, not penance. Are you with me? If I was living in that time, I think I would have been a Lutheran. <laughs> Praise God for the Lutheran movement. Beloved, in, in, in the 1500s, a man by the name of John Calvin also comes upon the scene, the founder of the Presbyterian movement, and John Calvin has a special burden for prayer. He says we can go directly to the throne of God for ourselves, and what John Calvin does, beloved, is he effectively restores the altar of incense. In the 1600s, there was a man by the name of John Smith who, upon studying his Bible, said, wait a minute, you can't baptize infant sprinkling. You've got to be fully submersed and confess before or repent before you're baptized. He became the founder of the Baptist movement. If I was in the 1600s, I think I would have been a Baptist. Whew. In the 1700s, beloved, a man by the name of John Wesley comes upon the scene, and John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist movement, and John Wesley has a special burden for getting the gospel out into the world, and he effectively, beloved, restores the seven-branch candlestick, let your light so shine. Whew. I feel like I'm in a race. Ten minutes and 23 seconds, beloved. One more article of furniture is left to be restored. Hmm. Okay, no, no, no. What movements would God call upon the scene in the 1800s? You're going to make me, you are going to make me get excited all by myself, aren't you? You're going to do it. I can't believe you. You're going to do it. What movement would he call upon the scene in the 1800s to restore the final piece of missing truth? Beloved, listen to me. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist by accident. This movement has a prophetic birth certificate, beloved. You are not an Adventist by accident. You are not some other movement. <laughs> beloved, God has called you for such a time as this. 
Beloved, it is this gospel. That's why the first angel's message begins to go forth with the everlasting gospel going into all the world because it is this gospel. This gospel couldn't have been preached during the Dark Ages because it had been taken away. But by 1844, everything had been restored. Beloved, listen to me. All Adventists are, are Baptists, Methodists. <laughs> we just kept taking the truth and moving it on. Listen, in 1982, there was a football game, Cal State versus Stanton. It was called the play. There were four seconds left on the clock. Cal State was down by one point. The band had already begun to celebrate. All Stanton had to do was kick the ball off, and then they figured the game is over. What are the odds of the other team returning the ball and winning? So they kick the ball off, and down the field the ball goes, and, 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 and Cal State gets the ball, and they begin running. And, and, and as the first guy's running, someone tackles him, but before he hits the ground, he tosses the ball to his teammate. <laughs> on the other side, the band is already marching on the field. People are on their feet celebrating. The second guy gets the ball, he's running, and the commentator is beginning to have his voice raised because the second guy gets tackled, but before he hits the ground, he passes the ball on. The third guy, the same thing. The fourth guy, the same thing. The fifth guy, the same thing. The sixth guy, they're screaming at this time. Everybody's on their feet, and that sixth guy runs right into the end zone. Beloved, listen to me. The devil, his band is on the field. They think the game is over. They think that you as Adventists are a beaten people. Beloved, I'm just telling you, I'm just saying that God wants us to finish the game. That's all I'm saying. Beloved, listen to me. There is no time left on the clock. Okay. <laughs> 1844 was the last time prophecy. In my mind, I see the angels on their feet or on their wings, just like people would be on their feet at a game, and they're cheering for us. They're saying, come on, take it into the end time. I mean, the end zone. Off God's people go, down the field, the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message, beloved. It's all there. And beloved, listen to me. i got to sum this up. The three angels' messages is nothing more than the message of Noah. Get in the ark. Okay, no, they didn't get that. Mm -mm. No, you didn't, you didn't get it. So let's try it again. <laughs> get into the ark. Get into the ark before it's too late. Beloved, why? Because the seal of God is found in the ark, and those who are outside of the ark will be marked for death. The angels with the seven last plagues are seen coming out of the most holy place. Why? Because those who receive the plagues are those who rejected what was found in the most holy place. Our message is to get into the ark. Psalm 91 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And you jump down about ten verses, it tells us that no plague... Okay, please. <laughs> No plague. Jesus comes. He cracks the sky. The dead are raised. They go to heaven for jury duty. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. It, it, when, the drug, when the books were opened back in 1844, it was very simply this. Satan is accusing God's people, and the reason God opens the books is not to try to condemn you, but to prove Satan a liar. So that when Satan says, he did this and she did that, God says, well, my book says that they repented. Oh. <laughs> The books contain key evidence to save you, not to destroy you. 
So the angel said, just and true are thy ways, O God. You judge righteously. Now, now, when the, when the, when the judgment begins at the millennium, what happens, beloved, is that the, 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 the righteous get to see the books, and they too join the chorus of angels. Just and true are thy ways, O God. And now we get to the end of the millennium when God comes down, and he resurrects the wicked dead. And, beloved, the Bible, well, we are told that... Listen. When the wicked dead are resurrected in that time, this world will turn into the biggest movie theater the earth has ever seen. We are told that in panoramic view, say that with me, panoramic view, everyone will watch the movie. Earth's final movie. Ellen White says each actor recalls their role. Beloved, do you, I want you to read. This is reality TV. This is no make-believe. I don't want the wicked looking at me and saying, you saw this movie and didn't tell me about it? You, you told me about Spider-Man. You told me about whatever other movie. You told me about Harry Potter. And you didn't tell me about the movie that counted? And beloved, now comes that time where God must destroy the wicked. And I got to do this briefly. Two minutes left, beloved. Time is running out. Time is running out. God must destroy the wicked. But beloved, understand the reason why God uses fire is not because he's mad, but because he's loved. You see, beloved, God is described as a consuming fire, but Song of Solomon tells us that fire is like a consuming love. You ever been in love before? Husbands, please raise your hand. Very good. You felt that fire. That's what God is like, beloved. He is fire. His city is a city of fire. His throne is a throne of fire. And he wants us to be able to dwell in that fire and not be consumed. Beloved, if you want to get to the presence of God, you better be fireproof. <laughs> and so, beloved, God, God, just like when God showed Moses the burning bush, and Moses said, how is it that this bush burns and is not consumed? God was trying to show Moses, listen, this is my ideal for humanity. He wants us to be able to stand in his presence, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in that fire and were not consumed. Yeah. Beloved, listen to me. It's the righteous that's, that burn forever. The wicked are not fireproof. They burn up. God will not allow them into heaven because heaven would be hell for them. Do you see how the devil flips it? God with those great big arms stretches out and embraces the wicked one last time. And in that embrace, the wicked feel the love that they have rejected. And they say, just and true are thy ways, O God. There is a unanimous decision to destroy the wicked. Beloved, God rebuilds planet Earth. And the Bible says from Sabbath to Sabbath, we will worship God. You want to know why? Because just as Israel, just as Israel was commanded to keep the Sabbath as commemoration of their delivery from captivity, so we will ever keep the Sabbath as a reminder of our deliverance from this earth. It's the movie. We have 44 seconds left. Beloved, please understand that God has called you for such a time as this. Stop sitting on the fence. Stop sitting on the fence. If you've doubted your Adventism, doubt it no more. If you said, I can't give a Bible study, I can't understand, listen, please, know that God has a plan for you. Listen, I, can you imagine giving this study to somebody? And just having them hear these words of truth, beloved, listen to me. God, how many of you believe God can use you? You believe God can use you? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would please teach us, Lord, what it means to love you and to serve you and to go into this world with your GPS showing the lost the way to salvation. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen and amen.